almost every day. I wish I could just turn away, but I can't. I said, I, that's exactly how I am. I can't ignore it. I can't ignore... Because it's happening to them, it's happening to me. <clears throat> OK, so here we are. This is at another episode of the Carb Strong cast. I'm new to podcasting, but it's a real honour to have Fiona Oakes in with us today. Hi. Hello. To be here. You just took us on a lovely tour of one of your locations here for your animal sanctuary. Yep. And it's grown a lot. Now, you're a world record holding vegan runner. Yep. But you don't really consider yourself that much of a runner. <laughs> no, I don't consider myself anything of a runner, to be honest with you. I just started running purely to promote veganism. Well, and we look around in the room and there's just medal after medal. And there's right behind me, there's this hanger full of medals and trophies everywhere. You've really got an amazing sort of... Well, what would you call it? A portfolio full of marathons and wins and races yeah. and... Yeah, I've tried to mix it up for the animals. I just want I just run to promote veganism wow. and I only started running because I run the sanctuary. I've, I've, I founded it 26 years ago and um, a couple of years after we started it, I thought, you know, animals are just coming thick and fast. They still are. Yeah. We need to address the cause of why they're coming in. Yeah. And I need to promote veganism because I've been vegan for now. Now I've been vegan for 47 years. I went vegan when I was six. Wow. So how? Um, I think I, I went self-inspired vegetarian at three years old. Just rejection of meat. Intuitively. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and it was a case of I just started to ask my mum, well, you know, what's the deal? Wh yeah. Why do we take? And my mum was very honest, and I'm blessed that she was very honest. Now, I will say at the time, what I find very inspiring about people like yourself is you have such amazing reach and a role model for younger people and we were fortunate back in the 1970s that my mum had a role my mum was a pianist she was actually taught by a vegan lady who was a piano teacher and they kept in touch um, after my mum left school and she was able, kind of able to articulate to my mum in adult terms what I was going through as a child mm. um, it wasn't difficult and my mum when I was in hospital with my knee surgeries uh, my mum was accused of child abuse Wow. For allowing me to be vegan. Veganism was aligned to an eating disorder. That's crazy. And my mum stuck her heels in and it was not difficult. My dad was on strike as a minor. We got no family money coming into the house apart from my mum's wage. But she stuck her heels in and said, it is cruel to lie to your child, not to tell them the truth. Wow. And yeah, so I've always had my mum's backing. And I think that's very, very important. If you can influence or support a person in any way, shape or form, it's important that you do that. Because I've always had my mum as my rock. Uh, but yeah, we um, I only started running to promote veganism. I've been vegan at that time for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get out there. And the animals need to stop coming into a sanctuary. Yeah. That's what we need to... Can't keep hitting at the symptoms. We've got to get at the cause. That's it. So um, there was no social media. This is back in the early noughties. Um, I've always been sporty. Even though I've got my knee injury, I was told that I would never walk properly, let alone run again after the surgeries. Wait I'd a second. You, you had knee surgeries. You were told you were never going to run again? Yeah I, was t yeah, I was very sporty as a teenager. And I developed this like gross condition and my knee kept crumbled. I had to have it removed. And I was told that it would mean that the running was out. You wouldn't walk properly. And indeed, I don't. When you look at me run, I limp. Everybody knows, oh, I knew it was you. I saw you in the distance. You were limping. Oh, thank you. Um, and so I took to cycling and I used to do a lot of competitive bike racing because that's single motion, you know, yep. no, no impact. Uh, we got the sanctuary. Um, I didn't have the time or the money for cycling because you've got to be on a bike like four hours a day, really heavily training. Didn't have the time for that. Um, but I wanted to do something. And the only sport, especially women's sport, that was getting any attention, marathon running because of Paula Radcliffe. And it was being billed as this really tough endurance event. You've got to be superhuman to do a marathon. And I thought, well, okay, if I could just compete in and complete a marathon, it proves that you can do anything as a vegan. Yeah. Simple equation. Wow. Better get good at marathon running. And um, it, it wasn't a plan to, you know, go and break world records or anything like that. It just kind of grew organically. And I wow. kind of wanted to do more and do more and do more. So I started... Playing road running, did what I could with the road running. I got a personal best of 238 and top 20s in like London, Great North Run, won the main start. And then I kind of mix it up. You know, do I go off and win smaller marathons? You know, do I look at these extreme races yeah. just for the animals, just to prove a point? You can do this as a vegan. Amazing. Uh, 
seems you're very driven and after you complete something like a really tough marathon, it's like afterwards you're still looking for more. What else can you do to sort of push yeah. this message forward? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you if I thought that I'd reached the pinnacle of what I could do, I'd back away and just concentrate on something else productive. Yeah. It's all for the animals. Um, so if you've run fast marathons, if you've run hot marathons, if you've run a marathon at the highest altitude ever, what else can you do to show that a vegan can do anything? And actually... Do it better than most. It's really crazy to me. That you're sounding, you're just, you're speaking like you. I did this marathon, but it's a lot tougher in practice than it is just, you know, how you're explaining it. Like, what are the struggles of running these tough races? Yeah, I mean, to explain, if people are interested in the kind of logistics behind it, to run a fast marathon on the road to get down sub three, sub two fifty, sub two forty as a woman is fast it's mm. like getting olympic qualifying times wow. um the training is very rigid you can't miss a session you're running nine times a week you're doing speed work you're doing hill work everything you don't even define a day by oh it's tuesday you think oh you wake up and you think oh everything aches and it's 10 800 meter pushers at lunchtime and an evening run you know it's hard it's really really brutally hard you're looking for about 100 110 miles a week every week just training training wow you're looking for a long run on a Sunday of up, over distance. You could probably go in 28 miles. The whole idea of that is getting your body to accept the fact of punishment. You, in a marathon, running at pace, you will hurt so much, you won't even dare think what's hurting next. So you've got to have been there day in, day out, and your mind's not, he's screaming at you, stop doing this to me, stop doing. But it's always screaming, stop doing. Yeah. It's screaming on a Tuesday when you're doing 10, 800 metres. Wow. It's screaming every day. Um, so for me, yeah, it was always about running 110 mile a week in training, nailing every session to get that to where you could be on race day. And that's a testament to the veganism because you don't just magic these times up. No. It's about recovering and being able to keep doing it year in, year out. An interesting fact is I have never in an almost 20 year running career had a running injury. I've had injuries that have stopped me from running. You know, like when I went to MDS in 2012, I went with two broken toes. Okay. That was caused by a horse standing on them. But I've never injured myself or had a conventional running injury. It seemed like you were injured before you started your running. You're yeah. With your... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I've got this limp along situation going on where I was told that I would never run. And, you know, it, I don't run conventionally. In no. fact, when Keegan, I never look at myself doing anything because it's just too horrendous to even contemplate. But Keegan kept sending these bits of film footage through of the film. And I wouldn't look and I might just catch a glimpse here and there. And then I went out to L.A. for the film premiere. And I was going to sit at the back of the, the um, cinema and like kind of hide and Rich Roll said oh you must come down the front and watch it and I said oh Christ I've not seen it yet and he said oh you must be very proud of it I said I haven't watched it yet who wants to watch yourself on a giant screen and I thought okay calm down Fiona you're in the Sahara Desert you've got all the cool kit on you've got to look decent and then all of a sudden I saw this like Quasimodo type figure limping out of the desert and I thought oh no you don't even look good in the desert Fiona and I do kind of limp quite heavily even if you look at my shoes Keegan noticed it one shoe's worn down the other shoe's not um but it's mind over matter it's mm. the reason you're out there this is the only thing I can do to help the animals so let's just give the listeners who don't know what film you're talking about mm. you are in a film called Running for Good yeah a documentary about your life story yeah and Keegan Coon, he's one of the directors, producers of Cowspiracy and What the Hell. Yeah. And he worked with you creating this yeah. film. I watched the film, I think, two nights ago. Yeah. Very inspired by it. Now, w one of the things that really blew my mind <laughs> is that the other day I decided to run a marathon without training just mm. to see if I could do it, basically, and to prove the diet and things mm. like that. And I had a sore knee, a knee mm. problem. I, I, it sort of stopped me from running about 33 kilometers in. Mm. Then after watching your film... Uh, what blew my mind is that you don't have a kneecap. Mm. You're missing a kneecap mm. and you still run these ultras. Yeah. How? I don't know. I mean, it hurts, but it's. I don't encourage people to go out and hurt themselves physically so they're not going to be able to walk again and no. end up in A&E. Mine hurts when I'm running. I've learned to manage it. I know it'll probably stop hurting when I stop running. Yeah. But there's no way I'm going to stop running until wow. I get to the finish line. Yeah. Nothing. Mind over matter. It is mind over matter. 
the pounding of road marathons, you're in the same position for two hours and 40 minutes or whatever you're out there. That's kind of hard. At yeah. 20 miles, a marathon starts at 20 miles. And people used to say, and I used to say, no, it doesn't. It starts at mile one. It really does. That's when the pain, the fatigue really gets mm -hmm. in. It's the way you manage it. And yeah. I think I manage it better than most because I'm out there for a different reason than a selfish reason. I want to run a certain time or I want to win a race. I want to do something which I think can impact on those that I love more than myself. And I actually feel it's a lot easier to do something for another creature or being than it is to do it for yourself. Yeah. I really wow. do feel that. Um, so for me, I can really hand it out to myself, but I'd never, can't even contemplate what it'd be like to harm another living creature. Wow. But when it comes to me, if that's the one thing I can do to help them, I'll damn well get out and do it. So it's like uh, when, when you feel like giving up, you look outside of yourself and realize yeah. what you're doing it for, who you're doing yeah. it for, and it drives you and you sort of sacrifice. Yeah. So it's like a sacrifice. Well, yeah. what are they going through? It gives you this perspective yeah. in that moment and that's what drives yeah. you forward. Whatever you're hurting can't be a fraction of what they're hurting. And at the end of the day, you can stop. Yeah. They can't open that cage door. No. They can't be free. I mean, the terror and the fear of, oh, it's just in incomprehensible. And you know what drives me? And it's probably a little bit unpolitically correct. Anger. Wow. Anger and frustration is what I run on. Wow. I, sometimes I'm out there on fumes. I'm so tired. Yeah. But I'm so angry. And is, have I really got to do this in the 20th century, 21st century now, to prove that veganism is the way forward? Have yeah. I got to do this to myself? Have I got to keep doing this to myself? Obviously, I have for the time being. And that's what... It's the injustice. Yeah. And it seems to me... Ha having a sanctuary for so long you're on the front lines you're you're directly involved with the victims of this mm. uh you know mm. animal agriculture this injustice mm. so i guess you, you you've suffered a lot of upsets and losing mm. animals and you know tell us about that that struggle yeah i mean it's really really hard and sometimes people say it must be easy for you because you actually care for the animals so you, you actually firsthand see those that are benefiting from the efforts that you're putting in mm -hmm. but on the other side you go out and you feed your animals and you see them happy. Yeah. But they're not the animals that look back at you. No. The ones in the crates look back at you and you think, but for a twist of fate, this little cow or this little sheep or this little pig could be in a crate. Yeah. It's a real life. I, they, they were going that way. They were heading that direction down the slaughterhouse. It even hurts more. To think, and you know, I never think about the ones that you can rescue and physically help. Obviously, I do because I, I look after them every day. But you're always one step ahead and thinking about those that you can't physically yeah. touch. You want to do something for them, just uh, in the hope, in the hope that one person might just the light bulb might go on. Amazing. And that's what yeah. drives me on. I really don't go keep going out there and beasting myself because yeah. I enjoy it. So you, instead of feeling helpless and powerless, you f try to work out what is in your control, what is in your yeah. power, what can you do? And yeah. then you put yourself through that yeah. to sort of prove this point and to yeah. drive this message home. You must really surprise a lot of people out there on these uh, races in these situations. Yeah, I mean, I think over the years, well, we started Vegan Runners back in 2004 mm -hmm. purely because I was qualifying for elite starts in major world marathons. And the equation was, you're going to go onto the start line and you're going to line up next to the best marathon runners in the world. Yeah. As an emblem. You're going to have on your jersey, people are going to see it on the TV, they're going to see it around the world. How about having the word vegan? on your, And we that's when we affiliated vegan runners 15 years ago, purely for the idea that running through the streets of London with a billboard promoting veganism. You can like it, you can hate it, but you can't ignore it because I'm there out the front of the race. When people see you going on to these starts, you are treated like royalty. You know, you're shipped in by boss. People are wanting Harley Gabrislassie's autograph and you're walking there next to them. I'm equal to these people. 50,000 runners back there are on the mass start. I'm up the front in the elite enclosure with mm -hmm. the best in the world. That's got to make some people you can you can't ignore that fact um and that's that's basically why we started everything i've done has just been in some way subversive way creative way to promote what i believe yeah. because it's not been that easy you know people have not wanted very hard to promote a message that people do not want to hear mm. they didn't want to know about it and especially in the days before social media i mean you yeah. have to be how can i do this what can yeah. i do to shake the the mainstream media weren't going to help you in no. any way and 
I kind of, when I realised the kind of time you got to dedicate to being good, I kind of thought, is it worth it? Because it's hard. It's mm. really hard. I mean, you know, I mean, my sister had a child and she's got, I've got a niece. I couldn't go to the christening because mm. there was training. You know, I, I can't, you, you know, I mean, three weeks running up to a marathon when you've trained and you're tapering. Martin used to come home from work and let me know when he was 10 minutes away and I'd go and live in a caravan because I was worried about him have contacted something at work, like a cold or a cough. Wow. And then give me that. So I never saw him for three weeks before a race because I... And you, you quarantined you, yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when you think about it, you can be as fit and conditioned as you like. If you've got a cold, you're not going to run right. No. You're not going to run at all. And um, you, you're set in your store five months of your life previous to that race. You've just honed on one Sunday morning mm -hmm. in the autumn and the spring when you're going to go and deliver... 100% of what you've got in the tank, every yeah. ounce of everything you're going to leave on that road. Yeah. And you're going to hopefully come away with the best result you can for the animals. So that you could, I mean, it wasn't a formulated plan. I didn't think, you know, like, um, I just kept doing it. I mean, I thought, right, okay, I've come eight in the Amsterdam Marathon. That's a big race. I was only beaten by Kenyans and Ethiopians. Wow. You're thinking, what can I do next? And I really, it's not been, I realized that over the years, I've been building up this massive CV of things that I've done. But it's purely been done for that one event. Now, put it to bed and go off and do something else. Amazing. I've not really thought about it in any of the terms than that. That seemed like a natural progression for you. And it seems like there's this fire that kept being stoked and like, yeah. and it, it doesn't seem like it's gone. It's still there. It's still there. It's still there massively. It'll be there on Sunday because I'm half marathon. <laughs> I've gone back to road running because it is kind of difficult for me to get away to do anything else. But yeah, and I think it is an anger. And I will say that, some of the results I was getting were big, you know, like I was coming in comparable places in, in the big races like London and Amsterdam and wherever that our best runners like Joe Pavey were getting. And I was kind of thinking, surely this is newsworthy. Have you got you know, like this disabled amateur runner mm -hmm. and nobody's interested. And I realised that it was kind of the veganism was preventing people from being interested, like a veganophobia with the press. Yeah. They won't mention the fact that you're vegan. If they even smell that you have an agenda, they yeah. steer away from it. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they yeah. really, really do. And I'm thinking, well, perhaps I'm not good enough. Right, then I'll just go and do a better result in Florence. <laughs> I'll go and win a marathon. What have I got to do? And that's when, after I'd done like loads of quick times and loads of wins, what have I got to do? And somebody then said, do the toughest foot race on the planet. Do Marathon de Sable, that's got to prove the point. Yeah. So you think, okay, I can do that. I'll go off in, in the desert and I'll do that. And, uh, you know, same as when I did the North Pole Marathon. There can't be a marathon at the North Pole. Jeez, that's got to prove my point, hasn't it? When people are tired, they say, oh, I feel like I've run a marathon. Or if they're cold, they say, like North Pole out there. Put the two together, put a marathon, put a vegan woman out there doing it. Put a vegan woman out there winning it. Put a vegan woman out there being the fastest ever to do anything like yeah, that. Yeah, the North Pole. Now, now, wasn't this the last of the seven marathons that you did across the it continent? It was the first. It was the first. Yeah. Okay, it was the first. Yeah. Now, you, you finished this race and then, like, was it... How many hours later till the next person? It was a lot of hours later. Till the, people were getting, like, hypothermia and having to stop. And, you, you were know. running through the snow. You were running through funny terrain. Yeah. It was, like, on the Arctic Ocean. Yeah. You could hear the ocean underneath you. Um... It was parts of it were fairly deep snow. Yeah. They would, and I kept falling over. And I didn't know I'd be able to do this kind of running because of my knee. My knee is not good. I keep dislocating it. So I kind of thought. Slippery. It is slippery. Um, and I just went out there in my old running shoes. I didn't know what to expect, which is probably just as well because if I had, I'd have been like freaked out. Wow. And um, yeah, I, I think that um, the guy that organized it wanted a woman to go out there and show that a woman could do it. Mm -hmm. But he didn't want a woman to go out there and show a woman could do it better so than anyone you, what else. What was your time? It was like four hours? Four and... hours, something or other, yeah. It wow. didn't take me that long. And so, um, some people were taking like 12 hours and stuff. Uh, Just because of the terrain, the cold? It's and... cold, it's terrain. I mean, you were coming into, it's nine laps, and you were coming in and having to have your headgear cut off. It was like, I think about minus 40. Wow. It was very, very cold. So you, you surprised people in that race, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm very good at managing my pace. I, 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 the one thing I know about myself is I know very little mm. and I realise that so I want to learn more rather yeah. than being a closed book thinking I know it all yeah. I know I know nothing Oh, and so for me I know what pace I can run comfortably and the key to running in those temperatures don't slow down just run at a pace that you can maintain for 26.2 miles. If you slow down, you will get hypothermia in those wow. conditions. If you don't slow down, you can keep the 
the, the everything warm flowing, and keep it warm and you will be okay the only thing is that i finished a lot quicker than the race organizers thought obviously they couldn't stand at the finish line and wait for the runners to come through because it was too cold so i'm running up to the finish line and uh i'm getting percy bear out and you know coming up to the finish and i'm thinking there's no one here where, where's no one here so i went into the warm tent and they're all having a cup of tea and the russians have provided this warm kind of tent and god <laughs> i said i'm back and it was literally like i'm back darling i've been shopping oh you're back i thought you got another lap to do no i've finished oh right could you go back out and run up to the finish again so we can film it? At that point, I can feel the hypothermia setting in because once you stop, yeah. you're not going to get warm again in those conditions. No. The tents that they give you to... Um, it's a bizarre experience. You arrive at the North Pole. Uh, they land the plane, they turn it around and they go back. A plane yeah. cannot sit on ice out there. It's going to go through it. You know, there's a ver- the, the landing process is the dangerous bit because it can get like a tsunami under the ice and it can just you down 13,000 wow. feet of Arctic Ocean. So they sent the plane back for the other runners and they show you into these appallingly hot tents and it's like a sauna so you literally come from like 28 layers that you're wearing to literally stripping off and you've got a t-shirt on nothing else and um the idea is that your body simply cannot warm up from those temperatures unless it is literally forced to warm up and it's hot and um yeah it's um it was just a bizarre experience but once you do get cold that's game over. You're not going to warm up again. You because do. your joints as well and you've got knee yeah. problems, like that cold temp. that's dangerous territory, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, I d- at one point I thought I got frostbite in my yeah. toe. You're told to let anybody know if they see any white spots, yeah. you can tell someone you've got frostbite. I did get a bit of frostbite up my nose, which does flare up uh, occasionally. But um, yeah, I mean, it was a bizarre experience. I d- I'd never really thought that much about what I'm doing, so I just like throw myself into it and think, right, okay, I'm going to kick ass for the animals. Wow. That's it. So you didn't overthink it? No. And that, that probably was probably, just well. that yeah. helped? Yeah, it probably did. Because maybe people get inside their own head a bit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, at one point I did feel pretty rubbishy when I was there, to say the least. And I mm. looked up and there's no 24 hours. It's just daylight all the time. And I thought, Fiona, you're in first place in the North Pole Marathon. You're at the North Pole. Wow. Get a grip. And yeah. dig in, and yeah, I, I, yeah, I was quite proud of what I did out there. I, I kind of ple- completely smashed everybody to pieces. Amazing. Um, that record does it still stand? Or yeah, I mean, they say that technically, a no record at the North Pole can stand because it's over the because it changes the course. The course is never the same because obviously the North Pole changes, and the, the course is only ever cut as near to the North Pole as the Russians can do it. Okay. It's actually a, a, a research base. They I use. got, I got yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they drop Russian soldiers in, they set the base up, and then you go as near to the geographic North Pole you can. Uh, afterwards, if there is time, if the weather closes in, they call everybody off the course and get you the hell out of there because you're going to get stranded, as we did in Antarctica. Um, but... Um, you will ship to the actual North Pole. I was lucky. I went in a chopper to the North Pole, the actual North Pole. And when we were going on this rickety old chopper, I was thinking, oh, I hope they've got petrol because I really don't want to get stuck here. I really don't want to get stuck here. <laughs> and they grabbed the old North Pole sign in New York that way and whatever. And um, one of the uh, guys, the, uh, the Russian guys, kind of went like that to me and he said, look down there. And there was a polar bear coming out of an ice hole at the North Pole. Wow. And he actually said, I think... They're trying to tell us that within 20 years, the polar ice cap will no longer be under ice. It'll be underwater. He said, I think that's nearer to 10 years. And that was 2013. Wow. You know, we've got a bit of a problem going on. With yeah. The I never expected to see a polar bear. I just thought the whole of the Arctic would be thick ice. Yeah. Not like that at all. Wow. Not like that at all. It's interesting because you're sort of running with the same principles that will help stop yeah. the ice caps yeah. from melting with yeah. global warming. And- yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I, it wasn't a choice that I would think. Oh, uh, when, I went, when we came back from doing the North Pole Marathon, the BBC rang. Yeah. We want you on the BBC. This is amazing what you've done out there. And then they rang back. Um, I was sitting at my mum's cottage at the time, and um, the researcher told me, we don't want to mention the fact you're vegan on the wow. program and you know i'm not beyonce knowles i can't just say oh i'm not coming then or it's on my terms or you know my way or the highway so i, I kind of went and i was sitting there live on thinking what do we do what do we do and i did mention the fact of do and they said why did you do the north pole marathon and i think if i'd have kind of gone down the old um, oh i'm just an adrenaline junkie i just had to do it you know because yeah. it's there to be done 
And I didn't. I did it to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee of the Vegan Society. Yeah. And vegan, proud vegan. It was like, oh, get her off, you know. Um, I wouldn't have chosen to go to any of the locations I've gone to if I hadn't kind of been... It was my only option to get the message out there. I'd done tangibly great runs in my own country that should have been reported on for what they were. Yeah. But they weren't getting. No. So you tend to think, right, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? I have to do more. I have to do more. And it was the North Pole Marathon and what came after it that was kind of, okay, break a world record. I can't do it in my own country. I've got to travel to do it. Yeah. But is the travel that I'm doing balanced off by the good I might do by doing this? Yeah. And somebody said, you know, some anti-vegan reporter about the travel element. I said, I'm a vegan, not a hermit. No. Like, you know, you, you, you can't, what do they want you to do? Just like go and live in a cave somewhere and keep your veganism to yourself? You, I was only trying to tackle... The good that you're doing outweighs yeah, any of, yeah, you know, of the, the negativity. And you've offset any carbon footprint yeah, by I mean, lifetime like, vegan. I, I, I run everywhere. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm quite happy to. I mean, I used to work in London. It was a 40-mile journey each yeah. way. I went on my bike. You well, know, please, you know. Yeah. Uh, but they've always got to have some ridiculous, bizarre, oh, but what about the insect you might have killed by? Yeah. Oh, yeah, right, go, yeah. Um, but yeah, and after that, the world records came. Wow. So, um, yeah, and uh, that was not an easy job. So just describe um, the major world record that we see in the film. It's like you you did seven marathons in seven continents? Yeah, basically what it was was when I came back from the North Pole, a few of the guys, because I'm not into ultra running, I don't really know. All I knew about running was... A to B, as fast as you can, so you can get home and look after the animals. Yeah. Two marathons a year. I've got no coach. I've got no physio. I've got nothing. Yeah. Just me running. That's all there is. Some of the guys there were a little bit more into these, and they said, you know, God, you're amazing at this. You know, you should do this world record. Fastest woman to run a marathon on every continent in days elapsed. So you just, you're in the Antarctic race in November. Just go to every continent and run a marathon, and you'll have the world record. And I thought, wow, that's great. So wait, wait, this was a spare of the moment decision or was it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, at the time I thought it was great. So I came home and then kind of look at the bank balance and think, no, there's no way yeah. I'm going to do that. Um, I put it on a back burner for quite a long time. And then um, I thought, no, I could get a world record for the animals. That's got to be worth going that extra mile yeah. for. We've got no money. All our money has always and to this day goes into the sanctuary for the animals. But my parents had got their little cottage. And uh, they said that they would um, remortgage it for me to do this if necessary. Unfortunately, wow. they didn't have time to remortgage it. So um, somebody stepped in and sponsored me. So I thought, excellent, I could just go to Guinness and tell them that I'm doing this. And, you know, it'd be great. They'll validate it. Oh, God, no, no, no. It wasn't going to be that simple. They said, you need to take two runners with you and they need to run next to you for each race to make sure that it's you that's running. Because you could enter a race in Australia and it's not even got to be used running it. How do we know it's you that's done it? Yeah. You know, you could, yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, what am I going to do? I can't do that. Okay, I, the plan I came up with was go and win them all. And then you... Then they know Then they know it's you. So now I'm challenged with going to these every continent every other week or whatever and having to win these marathons yeah. or placing them at the very least to validate it. And I remember it was really bizarre. Because I got off the plane in Adelaide and uh, the guy came, we were looking in the baggage or something like this, and he said, oh, you're looking for your bags? And I said, I haven't got any. Oh, right, okay. You come off the flight there from Dubai, yeah. Just coming to run and go. <laughs> yeah, he said, basically he said to me, you've basically come to Australia from the UK on a day trip. I said, yeah, in essence, that's what I've done. And I could say, oh, I know what I look like here. <laughs> Drug smuggler or something. Yeah. I said, don't worry, I've got a good reason for being here. He said, what is it? I said, I'm running a marathon tomorrow. He went, you're crazy. And it was, that, it was really difficult. I mean, I'd got like, I'd been in Australia eight hours and I'd got to get up and run this marathon, place in it, get back on the plane and come home and let him go to work. And it was tough. It was really tough. We were there and back to Australia and I came third place in the Adelaide Marathon and I was gone less than 96 hours. Wow. Amazing. And, you know, just showing the recovery rate of a V. I never even got jet lag. I never had jet lag. I've just like gone, come back. Okay, I've done it next one please and it was like just a cycle of these races uh going down to antarctica and do it did the same as i did in the north pole um smashed it and won the race so yeah. you came back after the seven races with the record i came back with three world records three actually world because records. actually it wasn't just the fastest in in um 
in time, in days, I was the quickest runner to yeah. ever do it because I've got, I've got to run these races pretty quickly. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I came back with three world records. Wow. I've been, yeah, the fastest to do it. Amazing. Now, I want to just keep on the, the race topic. What mm. is the, what would you say, that, I mean, they're probably all hard in different ways, but mm. for you, what was the most uh, challenging race you've been in? Um, running quick in a marathon is hard because you you literally, you can't, there's no stopping to adjust anything. No. You've got to be in that zone for, for that amount of time. So the fast ones have always been hard. Marathon de Sable was hard the first time I did it because I had two fractured toes. And What's that's, that? Uh, that's the um, race across the desert. It's billed as the toughest foot race on the planet. So you've got a week in yep. the Sahara Desert. You're carrying everything you need for that week. Sleeping bag, food, medication, clothes, anything you want. Self-supported. Self-supported, wow. totally. There's no sanitation. There's no very limited water, no washing facilities, no to- nothing. And every day you arrive home back at camp, You've just got a place to put your, your sleeping bag. And you get up the next day and you do it again. How long How long is this race? It's a week. Uh, and the distance? It's 250-odd K. Um, they tend to run a similar format of... There'll be 30 to 40 K each stage and then there'll be one double marathon or something like that or a bit more. Very, very hot there. I think the hottest we've ever had it out there was 55 degree heat. Wow. You've got massive sand dunes. You've got climbs. You've got everything being thrown at you. It's really, really brutal. I mean, I've seen people like with coming home and have to have skin grafts on their feet. Their skin's falling off. It's really, From really the tough. sand and the sun. Yeah, you get sand in your shoes. Game over. It really grazes is game over. your skin off, wouldn't it? Yeah, it just takes the skin off your feet. Um, I was going out there, um, ready to do it for the first time. Didn't know what to expect, as normal. And um, Martin's gone to work, and we've got an old horse at the sanctuary. She she got cast. She got stuck down in a box. She couldn't get up. I'd got to get her up. Put the ropes around myself and dragged her to her feet. But as she got up, she stepped back and stepped on my foot. So now I've got two fractured toes, and I'm going to be the first woman to attempt vegan woman to attempt Marathon de Sable. And I've fractured my toes. What do I do? I thought it's going to be really hard to watch that plane go. I might be able to get around. I didn't know how hard it was. I'd never done it. And um, so I went out there. And by the long stage, you could see the bone sticking out my little toe. You've got no medication. I've got nothing. No. I've got, I didn't show it to the race doctors. I knew they'd pull me out. So I just had to keep going. And um, that was brutally difficult. That was appallingly difficult. I went through real hell out there doing that. Because um, it's difficult enough without a fractured toe, but oh, just yeah. that added something. Uh, because to the in mix. a road marathon, if you understand me, you feet, you you like that. You f- you know where your feet are going to go. Yeah. But in these races, your feet are all like all it's over different. the place so they're pulling yeah. at this toe all the time soft and sand yeah, heat yeah. wind so yeah. sandstorms oh and... sandstorms tents blown away I mean one night the tent just blew down and after the Berbers had tried to put it up for us about three times and then you just laid there under the tent thinking at least it's warm and the tent just collapsed on these bodies that are laying underneath it and it was like oh what but am the I doing hot here? air and how do, how do you you'd need double the amount of water running through these they things. don't give you very much water at all you get uh, they limit your water to make it doubly hard if you need more water water you get extra points you know like deductive lose time yeah and if you allow yourself to go dehydrated uh if you take iv fluids it's like a five hour penalty they, they want you to be on the edge and they want you to learn it's, to manage your water so you're saying about the calories intake mm. you're saying they they only allow two thousand calories no they you can take as many as you like but, but how can you carry them? Yeah. It's, if you start getting a bag and you think, oh, that doesn't weigh much and that doesn't weigh much, but you start putting everything in this bag and you think, Jesus, I'm, I, I, how, I can't get it down to under eight kilos. And you put an eight kilo weight on your back and try to carry it up a sand dune. Or for, a a week. for a week. <laughs> you're in trouble, mate. You really are. So um, 2,000 calories is kind of one meal, you know, one of these hydrated meals and a few bars and you've got nothing else. Um, so you're literally losing weight. I mean, probably about ten kilos in in a week. You lose just lots of fluid and yeah, just and obviously, well, you're not taking in enough calories, eh? No, you, you. I mean, I know in Antarctica, I was told that for that marathon or a day out in Antarctica, you'd need about ten thousand calories for the day. Yeah, you really do need it in those conditions. So in the desert, yeah, I mean, you do need more, but you just, funnily enough, you're not even thinking about food. You're just thinking, I, I just don't, I just can't be bothered. I just don't want it. I just can't. No, I'm just not hungry. I just don't want it. Uh, the first time I did it, I was literally, I couldn't keep anything down. It was like painkillers. 
and a few ball sweets. That's all I had the whole week. But wow. I got through it. I got through wow. it. And uh, I was going to go back and do it again the next year and hit it hard without the broken toes. And then the North Pole race came up. So I did that instead. You did that instead. Yeah. It, do you, um, after putting yourself through something like that um, with minimal you know, consumption of calories mm. and in these crazy conditions with all these elements and in so much pain, did it make you think of what the human body is actually capable of? Yeah, I mean, I think that the human body, I think people actually probably about 10% of what they're capable of is what they deliver. Wow. And I'm all about getting the maximum out of yourself and, and challenging yourself to learn more about yourself. In those races, you go to dark places. Yeah. It re- you, do, you really in do. In your go mind? To, yeah, yeah, you yeah. really do. Everybody will tell you that. It's hard for everybody. No matter how experienced a person is, it's tough to be out in a desert. I mean, in 2014, I went back to Marathon de Sable. I, want, I was in great shape to do well in it. And indeed, I was in, like, fifth place overall. And one of the guys in my tent, Mike, Mike Julien, he had leukemia. He shouldn't really have been out there trying, but his battle was to prove that cancer doesn't need to define people. Wow. And he'd got a lot of people watching him, as I had in 212 mm-hmm. when I was doing it as a first vegan woman. And uh, he came back to the tent on day two in tears and said, I can't do that. I can't go back out there. I just can't wow. do it. It's too horrible. And um, I stepped home <laughs> and said, <laughs> um, okay, uh, we've got a problem. We want this tent to finish. Yeah. We, we want this tent to finish. Ironically, um, in the tent were four guys that, uh, um, you, you kind of, these tents are like Berber tents. And you go and uh, you, you're literally walking around on a Friday night, you arrive in the desert saying, is there any room in this tent for me? No. Okay. And you find a tent that's got a berth for one. I like to be in the edge of the tent because I like to keep myself to myself. And I saw this tent. There was one guy standing there. It looked quite nice. So I said, is there any room in here? And he said, that side's free. And this half's taken. Okay, I'll settle down over there. I didn't realise, I sort of cracked it. I didn't realise that amongst their party was Tom Borridge, the BBC news reporter. Oh, wow. And he was making a documentary oh, really? about their race. I thought, mm, bingo, I have a crack down here. Um, so um, by day two, Mike's really, really struggling. And I said, look, Mike, if you can get through tomorrow, which is 30-odd K, and you still want to do the long stage, which was a long one, 80 odd I'll do it with you and he said but you're in fifth place I said I know but I'll, I'll stay with you if no one else will <clears throat> if no one else will you know. <clears throat> waiting for you someone know, yeah, anyone. <laughs> anyone, anyone and so anyway I went toddled off the next day it was brutal the next day as I remember a lot of dunes and I got back to my camp and I was literally still riding very very high went to bed cooked my meal and I heard some clapping at the finish line it was dark and it was Mike and he came over the finish line, staggered over and said, does your offer stand for tomorrow? Because I want to give it a shot. And he threw wow. himself into my arms. And I said, you know, of course it does. I couldn't say, oh, I've changed my mind. I'm doing really well. I don't want to hit the long stage hard. And, it. and he, you know, he, he was compassion over competition. I really wanted him to do, to do it. Yeah. And um, it, it was brutal out there. We were 20 odd hours out there with him. He was on chemotherapy. Yeah. I was having to remind him to take his chemotherapy, his water. He was in a right state. But we got through it together, and um, actually, it's probably one of the proudest things I've done with my running. Wow. But ironic that the person that they said in the race, oh, vegans only, you know, they care more about animals than people. It was the vegan person that cared more yes. about another person that they, I chucked away my race for him, in essence. Amazing. I went the next day and won the marathon stage, but, you know, I'd lost so much time. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't make it. But it was completely enough. worth it for you. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think that's where the misconception with veganism is. It's you're in the animal camp, you're not in the human camp. Oh, no, we're in everybody's camp. Yeah. We are animals. Yeah. You know, it's compassion for all, not just for some. Exactly. And I guess like living here in the UK, we don't see humans caged up being exploited and murdered by the million, mm. but we see animals being caged mm. up and murdered by the million. Mm. I mean, so that that's going to take up the majority of our time. But yeah. I'm sure if there were children being exploited mm. and women being exploited mm. and killed like right here on our doorstep like mm. there are with animals, mm. we'd be, you know, more yeah, compelled to I help. I mean, I, I agree. Um, but, you know, we do see some terrible atrocities and it's, it's, it's really, really... I, I know when I went off to do one of my events, I was mm-hmm. doing a week. I was gone for a week. Yeah. And the headline on the paper when I went out there was a man, um, it was ISIS, and they'd burnt a, a soldier alive in a cage. Yeah. And I just thought, Horrible. Oh, I can't look at it. I, 
I'll, I'll be glad to be in the desert and away from headlines and away from all this social media. Not got a phone or anything. It's yeah. very liberating. And then I got back on the plane to come home, and I think it was two hundred odd people beheaded on a beach in in. Yes, I can't quite remember where. And I just thought, this really is happening in our world. In our world, in definitely. Our world today. Yeah. So we do in the West. We know what's happening. But I think there is a resistance to accept it because it's not directly affecting us. Yeah. As with the climate crisis and what's happening to the animals, it's not affecting me what's happening to them. And we need to embrace the idea our actions are exacerbating this or making yeah. this happen. We need to take responsibility exactly. and understand that we don't just act when it affects us. We need to act before because mm. when it does affect us, it will be mm, too, too late. late. Yep. And I guess we are in a position of privilege, all of us that have freedom here in this first world country and we can, yeah. we have the freedom of movement and we can do what we want and, mm. you know, and we should be sacrificing our f time and freedom to help those who have theirs taken from them. We have a freedom and a privilege. A privilege, yeah. Um, it, I believe truly we have a duty. A duty. We have a duty to mm. others. There are the most horrendous things happening around the world and I know it's controversial to say it and you guys are too young to remember this, mm. but it's like, I've tried to analyse things. I haven't, people have asked me questions. Well, why do you do this? Why do you do this? I've just been steaming on ahead. I've not thought, I sat down and thought, I must do that next. It's just been like one long... And I've had to actually check back when people have asked, why did I do that? Why did I do that? And in 1984, we had images in this country, certainly, broadcast to the main, from the mainstream, Live Aid, mm -hmm. Bob Geldof. And yep. we saw suffering in Ethiopia, certainly that my family and I had never seen the like of. At that point, from that point on, we've had no excuse. Yeah. Things are happening around this planet and we have the opportunity and the power to make a difference. Yeah. We just don't do it because we think it's not happening to us. Yeah. And that's the same as with the animals in the cages. It's not us and we don't care. We don't have that sense of urgency to no. like directly... Yeah. You know, oh. and that's why I think this environmental crisis mm. is, you know, creating these massive marches because it's going to affect yeah. us directly. Yeah. And it's just, it's a sad thing. Like we sh you exactly, know, it's uh, a sad thing that a lot of the time. I mean, I've been t I've been talking about the climate. I've been talking about the way our actions impact others for years and years and years. Mm. Nobody's bothered because it's not impacting them directly. The urgency now with the climate is. Because it's coming to our door. Yeah. We should feel ashamed. We should be overly keen to act now because we should be thinking now, but it's been at their door for years yeah. and we've done nothing. Exactly. You know, um, and that's so bad. And as I say, 1984 for me, pivotal as an adult, if you weren't doing something after that, then you really need to take blame. Yeah. You know, you, need, you really need to take on the mantle and really understand that this is partly due to you and mm. you have a responsibility and a duty now to join in and embrace this. Yeah. It's about being accountable and then, yeah. you know, like a part of my change was like, I've done so much wrong in my past and now it's time to change and give it, give back, you know. Mm. Um, for you, you've always been a compassionate person. It must mm. be a blessing and a curse. Yeah, I mean, I think it is. I mean, I remember speaking to an activist many, many years ago, a guy called Keith Mann, yeah. a very active activist back in the 90s. And um, the first time I met him, I, I'd got, just got the sanctuary and Keith had been, come out of prison. And I said, Keith, do you ever wish you were like everyone else? He said, almost every day, I wish I could just turn away, but I can't. I said, I, that's exactly how I am. I can't ignore it. I can't ignore... Because it's happening to them, it's happening to mm. me. It's yep. a reflection on me that my species is allowing it to happen yeah. to them. Therefore, we've, it's imperative that we do yeah. something. And for me, it's just not an option to not act. It's not an option to not step in where you can. It's, it's just not an option to feign ignorance. And sometimes I do wonder with people, you know, we live in a very sophisticated society where people, you know, electronic banking, they travel the world, you know, to say that they don't know where meat comes from or they didn't kind of click that there must be some suffering involved in mass producing mm. animals in crates. They enjoy it, do they? No. Enjoy living in a crate, you know? Yeah. Um, look at the standard you expect for yourself and your, t and your animal, your dog, your companion animal, and you're telling me that you think pigs enjoy living in crates yeah. and they're bred for it. Bizarre. They know. 
They ju- I mean, there's something that they intuitively know is wrong. And even if they're not living in a crate, there's a chopped up animal on your plate. Yeah. Whether you think they had a happy life or not, they're mm. chopped up on your plate. Now, intuitively, you know something bad happened along the way. Yeah, you? I mean, even in a slaughterhouse, can you imagine the fear, the, 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 I don't know, the desperation, the, the smell, smell of blood. And, it, yeah. They know what's happening. And these animals don't necessarily communicate the way we do. No. They're very, very much emotion-based and, mm. and they, act, they, they have heightened senses. senses so they yep. know what's going on. They really do know what's That's going on. That's why they on. need to be prodded down the kill line. Yeah, of course they do. High welfare animals or yeah. not, they're Que prodded. Queuing up to be killed. Yeah. Queuing up to be killed, desperately writhing and trying to... T- you know, a lot of animals actually break their own necks trying to get away. Mm. They injure themselves horribly. And what really shocks me is these transporters now there's been a spate of transporters that are turning over we had one locally of 39 cows um we shouldn't be moving animals on mass we shouldn't be doing this no. that, you know you think an animal is, is designed to live in a field be in a herd not in a cattle truck not no. three deep in a pig lorry not crated up in a, in a shed a chick- yeah it's disgusting covered in their own feces and, yeah you know it's disgusting and it, 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 it's actually it's shame on humanity for allowing this to continue. We need to evolve beyond this. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I honestly, as you know, much as I felt like being hating humanity, I honestly don't think it's consistent with the values most people hold. Most mm. people, I don't have to argue with them about, you know, do, are you, do you support animal cruelty? Most people are like, mm. no, of course I don't. But I'm like, I have to try to help them connect the dots between what they're eating and what they are actually supporting, you it's know? the brainwashing of the um, manufacturers and the people invested in making a lot of money marketing. from this marketing, humane and green pastures, and, and even even things when you actually analyse it, like you, a Christmas card. You see the Victorian lady walking in with the, the turkey and everything, yeah. oh, like this. all the film, everything you see, it's all this subliminal kind of it's okay, endorsing it, programming. It's mm. normal, it's natural, and it's really really hard for people. Some people who probably, you know, got different kind of triggers or motors in their brain to break free from it and say, no, actually, that is wrong. I can see yeah. that that's wrong. Uh, very often, they just need to be have it explained to them. And But I think deep down, people do know. The, what you've just said then triggered something, uh, a thought in uh, my mind about something called the standby effect. It's like a car accident might happen and there'll be like a group of people watching and no one will do anything. They're all mm. frozen. Mm. But then when one person runs mm. up to help, then the next person uh, yeah. runs up to help. And then every, I think that's mm. what's happening with the yeah. activists. Is it like movement. the Stockholm Syndrome where like they, they have a, an experiment where they probably have 19 people who are in, in, it, in on it and one person innocent standby who isn't. Mm. And they'll ask a series of questions and it'll be like, you know, you know, you know, what day is it today? Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. And, you know, they'll all say the same thing and it'd be all correct. And then they'll randomly, after about the 10th question, say, um, what day is Christmas Day? And one will say 24th of December and it'll go along the line. The, the bloke who's not in it will be thinking, yeah, have I got it wrong? <laughs> yeah. And invariably, they'll go with the crowd and say, 24th of December because they don't want to be different. They That's... don't, they, they doubt, they doubt themselves. That's something I feel blessed. I've never had self-doubt. And you don't have the fear of what other people think either. No. Like, like if you, if you believe in your own principles, it doesn't mm. matter what people think about you. Yeah, that's mm. that's the strength that a lot of people just don't have. Yeah, I mean, it's like something you know, like if you talk about people who make a difference, or like a game change, or something like that. They don't stand by and do what they're told. They do no. what is right despite what they in are told. Heart. In their heart. And you mm. know when you're doing something, you know it's right, and mm. nothing nothing can wave you from your beliefs. That you know, people say. Oh, you, you're really lucky. Um, yeah, I think I am lucky that I've known this from a very early age mm-hmm. and I haven't had to go through. I don't, I don't look, look down on other people. You know, I had one guy write to me, he's 84 years old, he just lost his wife to Alzheimer's and he's making this correlation between her disease and eating meat. And he said, you probably won't want to speak to me and I'm probably your worst enemy. And I'm saying, no, embrace it. You know, I mean, of course I want to speak to you, of course I want to help you. I don't look down sanctimoniously and say, I went vegan when I was six. And quite frankly, if you didn't do that, you're, you're all, you know, deserve what you get. I feel blessed. I was, I was in a fortunate position to just see what others couldn't see at an earlier age. Yeah. Um, do you feel like even if you weren't brought up in a home um, that, you know, your mum your was vegan? Mm. And no, mum's not vegan. Your mum's not a vegan. No, no, but she is now, but she, she, wasn't, she at wasn't at the time. She wasn't at the no, time. None of my family. They're not even animal lovers particularly. Wow. My family are not really animal lovers. She literally remembers things like she's been trawling back. Where did this come from? Where did this come from? And she remembers like, as a kid, I never had a dolly. I always had like farm animals. And she used to take me, this is way before your time, to like, 
one big shop in a local city to buy toys, you know, if you've got pocket money. And it'd always be, I'm buying a cow, little plastic cow. Oh, well, why don't you have this? That? No, I want a cow. And then I want some fencing. It's always been. And somebody actually, when I was two years old, sitting in my push chair, said, what do you want? And I said, I want a farm. Wow. And I just knew that a farm was where animals lived. At that point, I didn't know what happened to those animals, but I knew that that was the place that animals lived. And that's what I always wanted. I wow. always wanted to be around animals. N- not to the exclusion of being around humans, but I'm very comfortable around animals. And you, I mean, for instance, everybody always laughs because if you go out there, you'll never hear me say to Martin, oh, come on, darling. But the animals, it's very tactile. I can always say, oh, come on, bless you. Know? And I'm very, very... I, I feel very comfortable in amongst animals. That's what I've always done. I, I, you know, I, I'm constantly learning from them, and you know, it's just great to watch them interact. It's I, I just feel very fortunate, and I've never once had any self doubt or unwavered in my beliefs. I know I'm right. Yeah. I know I'm right. Um, mm. My conviction is there, and I'd rather die. Yeah. Than break it. Um, and I can feel that whenever you speak about this, it comes across in your emotion, and it's really powerful and. Mm. It comes from another place. It really does. It's mm. like, uh, and I guess people that don't really have those principles in them, I don't think mm. know if they really truly understand mm. like what we feel when we think of this, uh, what this means to us and what this means to, um, you know, the fight that we're sort of fighting and, and how you can draw that, that energy. Like, you know, most people feel like giving up, but that's not even an option for someone like you. No, I think the only thing you can do is I, I, I probably was, angry young vegan yeah um learning to and en- embrace that and kind of kind of harness it yeah so that you can chant what's the point of being angry impotent vegan sitting at home ranting on medications no. not being- go out and do something the way i've learned is i'm not saying that everybody should go and buy a pair of running shoes get off to the north pole run the- and have an animal sanctuary it's learning to work with what you've got your form of activism this is just what i've done because it's what i've had available to me at the time you could be as active in your own profession or you could be a very good knitter or something and be active, you know, start a business, vegan business. It's not all about one way of doing it. It's loads and loads of different ways of, of en- en- embracing it and, and kind of furthering the movement. But for me, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I've, I've, I've just always been passionate about what, what I've believed and I've just grabbed every opportunity that I can. People say, how do you get an animal sanctuary? I don't know. Grab the opportunities. Yeah. It's not like, oh, that's leaflet number 32, how to get an animal sanctuary. Yeah. There's nothing like that. You've really got to want it. If you want it, you can make it happen. Yeah. Whether it be an animal sanctuary or a, a vegan restaurant, if yeah. you want it. And the things that you earn, honestly, yourself, like for me, the world records, you will get so much back from them because you've earned them. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you, you learn to appreciate them. So you found a channel. Yeah. Well, it's somewhere to channel me anger. You channel, you yeah. but you're cha- channeling it in a positive way that's making an impact and making a difference. Positive, peaceful, proactive. That's the way of getting yeah. at people. It's not so much going and breaking the law and doing wrong things. It's actually coming at them with factual information. You can't, you, look, you may not like vegans. You may not believe in it, but you cannot deny. I mean, I remember one year in the um, London Marathon, Gordon Ramsay used to mm. really fancy himself as a marathon runner. And it was like, I can beat anybody, you know. Well, beat this vegan woman. <laughs> yeah. And he wouldn't have like, liked that. No. Um, he actually, he, you know, like he told Piers Morgan to F off. Yeah. He actually told me to F off when I beat him for 90 minutes. Oh, wow. that, that race in the London Marathon. And it's that anger that makes you think, nothing. You're not going to get past me in any way, shape or form. I'm going to do this because I'm doing it for them. Yeah. And it's, it's literally a way. I don't want to just be a gnarled person that, is hates everyone and everything and i think actually that's the most it disarms people when you're not like that yeah it really disarms them they don't know how to react Mm. and for me with veganism it's a really positive positive way of looking at things because somebody wrote about some festival in italy and they were serving a certain type of meat or sausage or something and then they defended people by serving chicken it was a when you think about it As a vegan, you could serve a meal that would not offend any religion and you could all sit down to the table together and enjoy in a peaceful way. And that's the beauty of it. It's compatible with all religions, It's compatible with compassion. You know what I mean? On any level. And that's the most important thing. So because it it doesn't hurt anyone. It doesn't hurt the animals. It's completely peaceful. Yeah, Yeah, it does. And I think it makes you a happier person inside. And another thing is also, I'll get on a bit, (laughs) much older than you, 
with a mental illness, not just physical illness, it's mental illness today. Yeah. I'm really balanced. I know where I'm going, I know where I've been, I know where I'm at, and I know mm-hmm. what I want to achieve. Yep. Very focused. I don't take any medications, don't don't have anything. I suppose the medication that I take is the doing good, the achieving for the animals. Gives back. Yeah, it gives back. Fulfillment. Yeah. Mm. And that's the point. Purpose. There's no there's no nothing you can have materialistically that will give back that same fulfillment no. and it's this cons- constant hype that you're being sold but if you look like this and you have this you'll be happy happiness cannot be achieved and bought it comes from within and expands outwards yep. rather than being bought and coming inwards it doesn't work like that that's the most important message i think you know just be happy in yourself and um do what's right yeah be, oh you know what what's your diet for for running i eat one meal a day wow. only one meal a day wow and um it's very often like locally sourced veg that's mm-hmm. another thing that you know um veganism you know i i do worry about the amount of products that are in brought in from around the world okay. you know ethically not really ethically saying it's about eating local eating fair trade mm-hmm. if you can eating enough not eating too much because i do think there is a trend with vegan junk food that mm-hmm. it's probably a bit out of hand we don't want just a load of unhealthy vegans instead of a load of unhealthy carnivores um but for me it's just realizing that we're blessed to have enough yeah and we don't eat in the fear of shells coming overhead and a house getting bombed yeah learn to appreciate the things that we have because when they're gone you'll damn well sure miss them mm. you will miss wow. them and it'll be too late then it's about being grateful for what we yeah. have and when when we're grateful, we're less greedy, and you know, yeah, it's yeah. just a sense of. And it life. is. It, I mean, obviously, I've never lived in a war zone. I've never lived in these no. circumstances. But when funny thing is, when for, for these extreme ultra races, you get a, an eclectic mix of people for all sorts of reasons, and you do get some bucket listers, mm-hmm. some wealthy people who are on a bucket list. And you'll, you arrive at camp the first night, you get these very posh voices saying, "Oh my God, it's disgusting. We can't live like this for a week." By day two. Oh, this is luxury. And we haven't got to think about running for 12 hours. It's amazing how perspective change perspective. in, in a wow. short piece, space of time. Because you appreciate. You don't start thinking about what you have. You look at what you've got and you're blessed for it. Amazing. So every, uh, when you come back, you turn the tap on. You're not looking at Perrier. Water. water. It's water. I don't care. It doesn't need to be flavoured with gold. orange. <laughs> yeah, it's gold. That is gold. You know, like, <laughs> and, you know, I've seen grown men trading paracetamols for toilet paper. Wow. And really, really kind of, how much? No, I think it's worth more than two sheets. I really do. You know, and it, it, it brings you back to a stark reality of what really is important. Similar, uh, exactly. I, I served six months in prison when mm. I was involved with gangs and things mm. like that. And, you know, people trading cigarettes and, yeah. you know, you're re- and when you come out of there, you're like, wow, like I have my freedom. I have, yeah. You know, it it's really is about perspective and yeah. gratitude that mm. you can be in a really crappy situation. Mm. But if you change your perspective on it and go, wow, it could be a lot worse. Yeah. That, that crappy situation yeah. all, all of a sudden becomes a lot a better. Lot better, better. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what people, I think, need to learn to do. Mm. Because actually now they've got so much, they don't know how to appreciate anything. No. No, and it's like well, and almost like we feel entitled to it. Like, yeah. you know, no, like of course I have this. It's like yeah. I should have more and more, and that's that's when people get depressed because yeah. there's always searching outside. It's like of- it's like being in a marathon that's never ending. You think, oh, I'm coming to the finish line. No, we actually moved it on a mile. <laughs> oh god, you know, you know, and it is almost putting the boundaries back, so it's unattainability, constant yeah. unattainability. And it, I, somebody said, oh Fiona, you never put anything on. Instagram or whatever, so I don't really know how to work it. <laughs> you know, and I said, okay, I'll put a picture on Instagram. That's horrible picture. Yeah, but that's truthful. I've just yeah. come back from training. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't come back. I never look very good, but I don't come back looking like I've not done any training. You come back and you've trained. You look like that. I'm afraid that's what it looks like. And for me, I, I kind of said to the guy, but don't you think you're messing with people's minds to think that, that's what you're going to look like after 10, 800 metres. You don't look glamorous. You don't look... Yeah. You, 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 that's what the reality of it is. That's where the value of it is. You, you've rogered yourself so much, you look that bad. Yeah. That's the effort you put in. That's the benefit you'll get out. Yeah. Um, because I think if I do put on this, on, it's going to be honest. Because yeah. I, I have a responsibility to those watching for this to be honest. Yeah. Because otherwise it's just not fair. Mm-hmm. It's taking advantage of people, exploiting people, exploiting animals mm-hmm. that animals are people you know it's all the same thing yeah um so because I, I was confused i went to this conference thing switch for good conference in uh, in hollywood 
And it sounds all very glamorous, but I was, they'd paid expenses, so I kind of did everything in one trip. And um, I went to this um, lecture on how to get good at social media. Not in half an hour, thank you. I couldn't quite work the buttons. But I was saying, well, yeah, but I don't understand how these people look so good when they've done it. She said, no, 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 they have like stock photographs taken and release them over the month. I was like, oh, that connects now. But surely that's not fair on the people looking because then they're thinking that they should be like that and it's not achievable. And they were kind of saying, but that doesn't matter. But it does matter because there's an individual behind that screen mm. that it's affecting and it could be affecting them negatively. Yeah. And that's not fair. No. Um, no. It's interesting how deep your compassion actually ex is inside of you and how, how far it extends. You really feel everything on every level i mean uh social media is an interesting realm isn't it i mean mm. because you weren't brought up with social media and you know well me neither really yeah. like it's only s sort of the last 10 years yeah. it's really started to kick off social media but what do you f what do you feel about social media in terms of its uh power to affect change i think it's a great servant and a poor master mm. it could be used for great good but i i do get concerned about the stories of the trolling and the mm -hmm. negativity that yeah. can come from it. That's a bad side of it. Mm -hmm. But for change, um, the mainstream media, I believe, is very, I won't say corrupt, but it's very, very steered in a certain direction. You won't influence that. Mm -hmm. So inf if it can be used properly and strategically, I think it's an amazing, amazing weapon. Yeah. For yep. good, I really yeah. do. It's a shame it gets used so in negatively as well. And you do hear, I mean, my sister works at the um, London Ambulance Service, and she recalls a story that um, one ambulance driver knew the first three calls she got were to teenage suicides. Wow, that's you know, I mean, I, I, you know, literally, I come from a an era where you were lucky to get a walk on a Sunday and you were excited yeah. about Christmas and the yeah. present. The idea of killing yourself, let's put it like that, would not have ever entered the thought. The fact that young people today are actually committing suicide with their whole life in front of them. Yeah. Because they're probably being bullied. And I spoke to one police officer and he said, you know, in our day, Fiona, if you were being bullied, the bullies stopped at the school gates. Yeah. Now they're coming into the home via the social media social side of media, things. So it's, it, it's mm. great if it can be used in a negative, uh, in a positive form, but yeah. negatively it's, it's kind of a bad thing. But to affect change, I think it's a massive tool. And I think people who know how to use it like yourself make immense change to people. You really do push the buttons for change, positive change and sustainable change. Well, now you've got this film like this film can reach people with your story mm. like but if we didn't have the 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 power to spread this film across mm. your story would only have fallen on the eyes and ears of those who had met you in real life or seen mm. you at a race mm. but now you can literally meet reach millions of people with your story that can inspire them you know deeply like yeah. a, a movie like that could change someone's whole life i mean the movie is very inspiring just i felt you know uh, it was i watched it after my marathon <laughs> and i just felt like really soft i was like oh, look at her look what she's doing look what she's achieving and it just put me in perspective i was like i could have pushed harder <laughs> and a sore knee she's got no kneecap she's running up a sand dune <laughs> oh, i'm whinging around a track i've got him he um, max has got my water and my you know my bars and he's running it out to me and i was like wow so it puts things in perspective and, and it really um it really motivated me i was like what am i gonna do next now you know yeah you get on that ladder of I can see what's coming here you know when I started I just never heard of like off-road marathons and ultras and I just thought A to B as quick as you can tw twice a year that's enough for me yeah and then all of a sudden you think actually you know I could do a bit more I could I could and and it's all and it's kind of a drug in terms of the fact that you see it been effective for the mm -hmm. animals and you see people you know thinking crikey that person can do that and they're they're vegan yeah. or they've been vegan all their life and then it kind of said, right I want to put the, the bar higher I want to put the bar higher yeah. I want to test myself and I want to test myself because I live a very challenging life at the sanctuary yeah. I get up at half past three okay. that's the only way you can do this people people say how on earth do you do all this you, you discipline yourself you get up at half past three and you start your work you don't wow. stop till the work's finished you eat one meal a day and you get out there and do it my, my running time is like people talk about rest and recovery I, I at best I might kind of do the bread unwrapping to rest when I've finished a run. I like really in the front door in the running stuff, out the back door in the Wellingtons. So I like to use the the tough events that I do to make myself tougher in civilian life, so I can do more wow. when I get back. 
So it's and, got... and what about mental toughness? That must you, that must still extend out to your work as well, like the mental yeah. toughness in a marathon, like breaking pain barriers. And yeah, I mean, it's very. I mean, I do this three hundred and sixty-five days a year, getting up when you feel ill in the cold and freezing rain. When you're doing this every day, every day, with the same worries that you've got, you know, obviously financial worries, keeping the animals are the animals well, you know, it's it's tough. But mentally, I have no talent for running. You're, you're, if you set about running, you will, I can tell you now you'll achieve more than I ever have. I've got no talent and disability. But I'm tough. You won't break me. Wow. Ever. You won't break me. I, I am absolutely 100% for them. And I've often thought that people have always think there's a payoff with me. There isn't. It's my way for them or the highway. You won't, yeah. There's nothing you've got that I want no. more than doing right for them. Wow. Absolutely, and you will not break. That's what um, Steve Diedrich from the Marathon de Sable said. If you turn up at a start line on one of the races, a tough race, I know you'll finish because you're not. I'll die trying. I mean, I'm quite happy to push myself wow. over that limit. It's going to happen because I am going to get there for the animals mm-hmm. because it's it's there. They're my prize. So as much as people value uh, put themselves on a pedestal or they they you know having a flash car. Doing good for them is all I'm concerned about. And beyond that, there's no Fiona. Wow. That's the edge you have. Um, it seems to me, like, what do you say to those uh, people who, I guess there's a lot of doubt that's been injected into the movement about health. Uh, there's a lot of fear mongering to do with health. There's a lot of people that are sort of um, becoming ex-vegans because of the fear for their health and they might not feel the best and, you are doing these massive days at work, looking, caring for all of these animals and training and running these superhuman events, mm. and you're recovering fine. You're eating one meal a day. What do you? What do you? What goes through your head when you see someone like, wow, they 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 go ex vegan because of some health uh, problem? Or what, what do you think's happening there? I think the only thing wrong with their health is their mental stability. To be honest with you, any diet, if you want to look at just the food intake. Mm-hmm can be poorly managed or okay. well managed. A balanced vegan diet can sustain anything. That's yeah. it's ridiculous to think otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure what the motives are behind people. I would say that they're obviously um, mismanaging their diet horribly for what they're doing. Um, I mean, people go on and on about protein. I don't think they know how many pro- how much protein there is in oats. No. Or something like very very basic. Yeah. Um, I think people over assess diets and they kind of almost imagine problems. You know, it's like the person that you offer a piece of cake to yeah. and it's vegan. You're kind of going like this. Ooh mm. ooh ooh. You know, is it is it? And you think it's just not got an egg or milk. Some Horrendous Four or five been, yeah, yeah, you know what? What are you kind of trying <laughs> away from it? But so the the barriers there. Yeah. They start with that barrier and yep. kind of build on it. Yeah. And uh, for me, it's just lunacy. I mean, I don't, I don't actually take any supplements. Wow. I, I have supplement. I mean, I do. I'm a bit of a Vegemite fan with the um with the B12. In fact, I went to a doctor's conference and I spoke for half an hour and I said, I don't take vitamin D and I don't take B12. Mm-hmm. And then one of the doctors said, well, you're dirty and you grub about outside all day, so you probably don't need it. You're getting it naturally. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay for me. Uh, I don't Thank mind you. that. Uh, but <laughs> that's what made me very miserable about not getting my message out there. I didn't intend when I was six years old to be thinking, I need to have done this. But at 53, I'm still winning over people straight out wins in races running faster than most people can imagine as well as tackling this lot and i'm going at it like um i mean keegan came to do the film he said it was suicidal what i do every day and i'm energized and enthused both mentally and physically to do it Uh, what more do you need to say i mean uh, it's ridiculous to think that you can't sustain this on and i think sometimes i've been kind of ignored because I've been the kind of living proof that it's wrong. Obviously, if you manage a diet, I want to say well-managed diet. It's not got nutritionalists. It's just obvious. Yeah. Um, Listen to your brain. I mean, I don't have a Garmin. I have an old Timex watch. And um, I'll kind of work backwards. How long, what pace am I running? That's kind of... Oh, you don't have any of the gadgets? No, because the gadgets don't know if you've got a cold coming on, if you've had a stressful day, if you're tired. In here, you've got a computer about your person that's far more sophisticated than anything man could ever develop. 
Learn to use it. Yeah. And your body will tell you if you if you're getting you know if you if you're not getting the right vitamins. Learn to listen to it. Learn to assess what's going on and address it. And I find it. I, I, I sometimes think that a lot of people who just one minute they're vegan, next minute they're not vegan, are looking for like I don't know uh, attention. Okay. You know, I mean, I, I just don't see. I don't see what's difficult. I really don't see what's difficult. I mean, you know. A lot of people say to me, look at the size of your upper body. I don't, do you do, you do weights? And sometimes I've been a bit embarrassed and said, oh, yes, yes, I do weights. I'm thinking, no, I'm just big. You know, I do shoveling. I, I shovel all day, you know, and I'm strong. And I'm vegan. And yeah. I've been vegan 47 years. And I've grown up vegan. So, you know, check that myth that, you know, oh, you know, what are you going to be like? Long-term when vegans, is, that's yeah. what they say. After a certain amount of time, yeah. your deterioration is going to yeah, set in. You will, yeah, and oh, I'm still there thinking. You're still waiting. Yeah, I'm going off Meriton and Savile again next year. I don't know what you're doing, you know, but I mean, you know, so it won't, you know, I'm, and I think the energy levels that I've got and the clarity of thought that I have, I see everything black and white. Yeah. I'm very, because it is black and white. The world mm. is black and white. And um, to me, that's wrong. This is right. Yeah. End of. Um, my mission is to, to show other people. Um, and cut through the crap, basically. Wow. That and and you know, but it's a hard job, because this is a message that has been sold to people over many many years, mm-hmm. decades and decades and decades, and to get people to believe in something that I'm not 100 percent convinced they're fully invested in yep. is difficult. Yeah. Um, and as as you said, with the climate crisis, it's ironic that the one thing that's made people wake up is not the animals, is not their own health, it's fear of it coming to their door. Yeah. And their lifestyle. Now they're starting to make a move. Yeah, because you know. it's lifestyle. You know, it's, it's you know... Um, and But to me, the easiest thing you can do is go vegan. Yeah. It's not the only thing you should do. I know they talk about... Recycling is great, but to me, it's using less. Yeah. That's probably a hard message to sell. You can't just think oh, I can have what I want and put it in that bag and it'll go away and I can yeah. keep having. You've got to start addressing the way you live and thinking, I don't need that. I don't need that. Um, so I think that veganism would buy us that time that we need to implement changes for the future generations that would probably make a difference. But I actually do think that if we don't, I think people should be grabbing veganism now and saying, yeah, of course we want to do that, but we want to do more. Yeah. Rather than resisting it and going, oh, you need, you need to go with a little bit less meat on a Tuesday because of the, you know. It, we so need vegan to... needs to be the first step because yeah. if you start addressing, I'm recycling, but I'm eating 10 steaks a yeah. week. And like... yeah. Sort the steak out first. Yeah, yeah. Then we do the eggs. Yeah, yeah. And don't let that be the end. Just continue, continue, continuously make conscious decisions outside of that. And I that. believe that if you do go vegan, the clarity of thought, the way you, st- the compassion comes into your life and then naturally you mm-hmm. start to think about other things. It's like a ladder. Yeah. That's the first step. And then you start saying, okay, I feel better. I want the world to feel better. Yeah. I want other people on this planet to feel better. It's the first step, not the last step. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's it's a difficult one to make people, you know, take. And unfortunately, it is saddening that it's only with the climate change uh, that they are they are are considering it even now. But you know, I I do f- fear for things like water wars and, yeah. and you know resource wars when you know whole continents are wiped out and people start getting nasty over things like water and um, the things that we consider to be a right. There's no no rights on this earth. You earn earn privilege earn rights and we're not we're just expecting them it's like um it's not the age of enlightenment now it's the age of entitlement Entitlement. everybody yeah. thinks it's their right and, and when you think about like a month's worth of showers for one burger yeah like yeah <laughs> wow yeah like you left the tap running for that long like yeah. you know but it's yeah. it's completely moral uh, uh acceptable in society to eat a burger that uh, takes yeah. that amount of resources just to sustain that amount. It's, it's how many yeah. calories in a bag? But it's all right because I've got a hemp bag. I've got a recycled yeah. bag, so it's all okay. I can just live my life. No, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. And it's like all these silly arguments. You know, like one, it's 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 ethically better to to eat meat uh, because um, only one life is killed in the production of eating meat. This is some ridiculous argument. I've heard I, this one. Yeah. Uh, rather than all the insects that are killed growing your vegetables, and you feel like grabbing the person by the throat. What do you think these animals live on? This is a big point I want to make. Now, now, what they all say is, okay, so they don't eat grain-fed animals. They eat grass-fed beef, right? So grass-fed, obviously, they, this is what they think in their mind. They're just eating the grass that's on the ground. Mm. No, we've seen all this, uh, the mm. uh, 
big haystacks you have out here. Mm. This is what they're harvesting mm. to feed these grass fed yeah, animals. Yeah, yeah. So that's all crop. Uh, you know, land use, water use, yeah. crop deaths to feed grass-fed cattle too. Like, yeah. there's no grass-fed cattle can be grass-fed like pasture all year fed. round. Like they're not, you can't do it. They're putting them in the barns it. and they're feeding them. You of course, know. they have in the winter. What they live on? You can't live on grass in the winter. It doesn't no. grow. You know, well, well, think about it. It can't happen. So they're harvesting grass to feed yeah, to these cattle. Absolutely, yeah, it's hey. the same problem. Hey, hey. and the, uh, you know, pre-grain then, crops and yeah. yeah. So we've got to, so it, and, and you know, the resources that takes in terms of, you know, the vast machinery that goes out yep. there and produces and the storage Water. and the, yeah, it's massive, massive, massive. Mm-hmm. We just need to cut out that middle product, yeah. which is the animals. Yeah. You know, but what are we going to do, Fiona? We won't see animals anymore. Well, where do you see them anyway? They're all in blooming we sheds them, and crates yeah, yeah. and whatever. I mean, you're not exactly going to see them. You know, we, for, for, you know it, these animals are genetically modified and bred. For your food, for no one, they're not natural animals. They're not naturally living. That's what people say. Oh, veganism is not a natural diet. I was like, well, what cows are you eating? Yeah, you they're that... naturally occurring cows. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, so... it's it's so ludicrous. The arguments are just pure lunacy. Yeah. But actually, they're becoming a reality mm. because the, the the planet, the environment, cannot sustain no. the greed of the first world. No. It can't do that any longer. And, you know, you've got... I think there is a statistic you need a planet three and a half times as big as the one we've got currently for everybody to have the same. And it's like these people who look at the images of the third world and say, oh, isn't it awful? Yeah, but they can't have what you've got. For them to have better, you've got to have less. You've got to really modify your way of living. We can't wave a wand and make their life better, you've got to implement that change individually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you've got to understand what you do individually will have an impact. Even if the impact is so marginal in terms of the globe, but it's an impact on you mm-hmm. to want to do more yeah. and more and encourage others to do the same. That's yeah. the impact. That's the buyback. Not going shopping to Lakeside and coming down with a load of carabags. That's not the buyback. The buyback is actually making this world a better place for all. And it all starts with such a simple change. I mean, when you're in the supermarket, I mean, like I was in uh, Sainsbury's the other day and it's literally four footsteps from the Mm. dairy to the soya milk. And Mm. there was like a 5p difference between the soya milk and the regular dairy. Mm. And the amount of the, 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 Difference in water use, land use, mm. and sentient beings' life of suffering, huge, it's, huge. Yeah, before, I mean, people yeah. say, oh, vegan diet is a diet of privilege. Yeah, check this. My dad was on strike. There no privilege going on there. You know, and eating fresh, eating locally, eating enough without eating too much. And also, I always think that if you prepare food from scratch, you respect it more. Yeah. I prepared that. I don't want to waste it. I invested mm-hmm. time in mm-hmm. that. I'm not going to waste it. You think a lot more about what you're eating when you've actually put the ingredients in. Did, crikey, I didn't realise that much. Went in, you know, you, a little bit like the difference between spending cash and a card. Mm. When you actually say, oh, it's £40, you wave your little card over the machine, mm. you go, £40, oh, gosh, that's four, ten £10, that's quite a lot. You know, you yeah. start thinking a little bit more carefully. Also, I've got this idea that... Um, it's a lot more natural. It's the kind of joining and coming together for families. You can prepare food. You yeah. can invest in it together. You can sit down and enjoy it together. Um, it's, I don't know, it's just the way... Of, people say, oh, but, you know, on the fast pace of life, Fiona, well, what are they fast pace of life? What are they doing? Just creating more CO2 emissions, going to more places that they don't need to go to and doing things that they don't need to do. How about checking back and just enjoying what mm-hmm. you've got? Yeah rather than this fast pace of life, doing unnecessary things. And, you know, okay, it's supposed to be an expensive... Any diet can be as expensive or as inexpensive as you choose to make it. So rice is the cheapest food per exactly. calorie on earth. Exactly. And it's vegan. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> rice, potatoes, all the things that you're told are bad. That's basically what I live on. Beans, chickpeas, uh, fresh vegetables, local. You know, the basic stuff. It's not, you know, okay, if you're going to live on fancy tubs of ice cream all the time but how about going back to a time when okay i know you might argue that you know some guy can go and fill his trolley feed his family for whatever from iceland but how about going back it's not expensive if you only ate what you need yeah rather than bag of oats yeah exactly i eat oats every day and then have a treat what's wrong with having a treat a treat a treat occasionally now and then but it's not every day you don't have to be completely just eat potatoes and vegetables i mean you can have an ice cream here and there on the weekend but like 
keeping your daily diet simple, it's gonna yeah. it's gonna love you back too. I mean, exactly. I, I, I do care about my dad. My father suffered and died from preventable illness, and it was due to his lifestyle predominantly. Yeah. And it's horrible seeing a family member suffer and die like that. And I did, like the doctors were giving him advice that they did, they didn't know any better, but they were giving yeah. advice that that caused his, more suffering to yeah. him, and they're t- t- recommending bacon and butter and you know all of these horrible foods. Yeah, like if it's just it's I, I care about human health as well, even though my primary exactly. focus is the animals. Exactly, I don't want to see people suffer and die around me, and you know. And um, seeing people that are becoming prisoners inside their own body, having yeah. complicated problems, you know, type 2 diabetes that they shouldn't have. He's no. seen young children, you know, like obese, not able to enjoy the real pleasures of life, like getting out there, being in nature. That's really, really saddening. That yeah. really is saddening. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I honestly believe, without signing too hippie, veganism is the lifestyle that mm. gives back. If you could got the eyes and the heart and the soul to see the gift in front of you but not everybody has no um that's unfortunate but um as i say um you know you can only do your best you can only do your best to promote what you believe in you can only do you can live by example yeah. that's all i've ever tried to yeah. do live by example and let let my actions speak louder than my words you may not like it but i've done it you can't yeah. rub it out i've no. done it you can't yeah. you just get rid of me i've got all the world record certificates here i've got all this you can't say i haven't done it yeah because i have and you can't say I haven't done it with compassion for the animals. Yep. And, you know, okay, I don't know much about training or running. I just know I run as hard as I can for the animals. Um, but mentally, sport's about mental as well as physical. Yeah. And you know when you line up, I've hurt nothing to be here. Yeah. I haven't exploited. Mm-hmm. That gives you a tremendous sense of achievement mm-hmm. and positivity. And that's what a lot of the Vegan Runner Club, we started that as, there was, literally, we were the only vegan in the village. And I was literally, what's the point of being in the middle of the 50,000 runners at the Berlin Marathon? I want to be out the front with Halle Gabbard Slassie so people see that and see it for what it is, the reality. Yeah. It's the only thing I can do. I can't have an advert on the side of a bus, but I can be a positive, active advert for the animals. Now it's, I think it's the second biggest or biggest running club by membership in the UK. Wow. All over the world. And people go and they mass takeover starts. So wow. the vegan runner presence is massive. And mm. it's to a captive audience of people who actually are interested mm. in their diet and interested in ways of improving their sporting prowess. So if you're out there going and beating them by two hours in a marathon, hey, I want to know more. Yeah. And that's what it's about. But about being positive, you know, give them something that they want, better performance or a better lifestyle, and, and then say, you know, this is the way to it. This is the key. Just unlock the door. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. You, you're like the queen of no excuses now, you, you know. <laughs> look, like, look, most people couldn't handle just hand, uh, the, the sanctuary alone mm. and let alone the training for all the the athletic feats that you mm. do and, and doing it on a vegan diet as well a simple yeah. vegan diet a simple, simple woman but whole food vegan. super vegan woman <laughs> amazing yeah. like uh, your story is amazing and inspiring it's really put, snapping me into perspective and it's like wow well, like it's just it's like well maybe i can do more you know and mm. you know i try my best but am i do i can i dig a little deeper here like i always feel like what i'm doing isn't enough and mm. like your story is really making me feel like you know i could actually do even more and i think we all should hold each other keep pushing keep pushing ourselves you know and mm. having that t- men- tough mindset you know and mm. b- having the perspective of the suffering the animals are going through and it's worse for them let's try to p- p- really push ourselves here and um let's uh just try to wrap this up but i want to know what's next for you do you have anything in your sort of eyesight for the future I suppose just keep going, doing what I'm doing. As I say, I'm qualified to run for England in the 10K, which is yeah. kind of dropping right back in distance for me. Uh, but I thought I'd do that. Mixing it up. Yeah. Showing that you can continually keep surprising people by what you do. Yeah. For me now, obviously, it's the longevity side of it. I can keep doing it over and over and year and year out. Growing the sanctuary and securing the sanctuary. Yeah. Securing the future of the sanctuary. Getting out there and showing people. I mean, obviously... You know, youngsters can go. I I want people to see what you, what you're going to be like in 50 years as a vegan. Yeah. This is what you're going to be like if you know it. So now, think about your future. It's not going to be detrimental. Just be positive. Any yeah. form of positivity is what I want to grow. I never, I've never formulated a plan. If an opportunity comes along, and I think it's going to be positive for the promotion of veganism, yeah. I'll do it. Otherwise, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing here, rescuing as many animals as I can, promoting in a positive way what I believe in, keep running, and just keep. 
keep one step ahead of the game with yeah. regard to surprise people with the next thing. Amazing. I don't know. I'm about to do Marathon de Sable next year. Hopefully, I'm one of the tipped runners, so a big result in that would be nice uh, when I do it for me this time. Wow. It seems like you follow your heart in this journey. You, you really... Just yeah, yeah, there's no plan of it. You know, mm. you can't plan. You're in a war zone. You know, you literally, it's almost like guerrilla warfare. Mm. What am I going to do next to shock them? What am I going to do next to, like, you know, what, you know, what, what will be positive for the animals? What's the next thing? Um, so I don't plan. I just grab opportunities. But you when have I your can. intention really it's always, fixed. It's a f always the same attention. I'll quickly look at something and say, will that benefit them? No, mm. move on. So your values and your intention are always there and then you, you follow your heart and wherever that takes you. Yeah, I mean, the animals are like my soul. Yeah. There is no defining bit between me and my love for them. I'd literally, if I thought that laying down and dying in front of a bus now would be the key for humanity to, to actually wake up, that wouldn't be an, it would be an obvious thing to do. I've given yeah. everything I've got. I really have genuinely given everything I've got. And I think the only thing I want to do is keep being able to give everything I've got 100% until I drop down dead. Amazing. Thank you so much, <laughs> Fiona. You're welcome. You're, I'm really moved by this uh, whole podcast and coming to meet you and your movie was just fantastic and we should really get it out there to more people so more people know your story. Mm. Uh, I've been vegan for five years. I've only just recently found out about you and mm. then, you know, getting there's something inspired me to run a, a man called David Goggins. I found him on the mm. internet and then, then I found your story and mm. I was like, wow, and then it just really drove me to come down here and meet you and it was a real honour and what you do for the animals is just, I, I cannot express my gratitude enough. I mean, I've been in this fight for a while and it can, I can feel, you know, like sometimes it does become overwhelming and, you, you know, seeing all the suffering, but then stories like yours are just, just amazing. And your life um, will always be here in it that we can point back to you and go, look, well, look what Fiona did, you know, look at, look what she achieved and no one can ever take that from you. So thank you. Thank you. I got my hair stand up on end mm. about 40 times <laughs> throughout that. Okay. So now tomorrow you're wrong. Yeah. You've forgotten that. <laughs> You've forgotten it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>